Ancient pottery artifacts can reveal the technical and artistic traditions of the people who created these objects hundreds or thousands of years ago. This video considers the oldest pottery evidence of remote Pacific Oceania, dated at least as early as 1500 BC at several sites of the Mariana Islands. The information here hopefully will encourage new thoughts and ideas about the local and regional archaeology as well as about how these ancient artifacts can be studied in any place or time period. The oldest pottery evidence of remote Oceania coincided with the oldest archaeological site, Layers, made by the first people who ever inhabited this region of the world. The earliest discoveries in the Mariana Islands at 1500 BC have transformed the previous academic views about a pottery style called Lapita in the central Pacific. Previously, the Lapita style of pottery was viewed as the region's oldest pottery tradition that emerged first in the islands near the east of New Guinea around 1400 through 1300 BC, followed by an expansion into the remote distance islands of Melanesia and West Polynesia around 1000 BC. Now, the evidence from the Mariana Islands has shown an older occurrence at 1500 BC and in this different and much more remote northwest part of the Pacific. The emphasis on the pottery evidence is largely because pottery happens to be an impressively abundant and durable artifact category. Whenever people first produced pottery anywhere in the world, then the resulting pottery fragments inevitably were numerous and obvious in the archaeological record of each place. A controlled excavation can reveal an abrupt layer or horizon of the first pottery of a region. One famous example has been the Lapita pottery horizon in Melanesia and Polynesia, and now another older example has been identified in the Mariana Islands. So far in the Marianas, several sites of the separate islands of Guam, Tinian, and Saipan have revealed an abrupt pottery-bearing horizon, all consistently starting around 1500 BC. The abruptness of this horizon reflects the sudden appearance of many people living in multiple places of the Mariana Islands all at once. The initial pottery-bearing horizon involved much more than just the pottery. The archaeological layers have revealed stone and shell tools, diverse shell ornaments, food remains primarily of a seafood diet, and the remnants of house posts and supporting features positioned along the ancient seashores. In these contexts, the pottery fragments have constituted the most numerous artifact category and the current video here concentrates on the pottery evidence as a way to support new thoughts, questions, and discussions. These oldest site layers started to form around 1500 BC or perhaps slightly earlier, and they continued to accumulate as coherent sedimentary units until they were overlain by the next sedimentary layers around 1100 BC. The physical parameters of the layer deposits provide the basis to identify a measurable unit of time, in this case spanning about 400 years from 1500 BC through 1100 BC. Within this 400 year long window, several generations of people had lived at the ancient seashore sites, while some aspects of their lives probably changed from one generation to the next. The limits of the archaeological evidence can portray a collective overall time period. The complete site records have revealed the full chronological sequence of several archaeological layers and time periods. The artifacts and other evidence of course change throughout this time sequence, but again I want to clarify that the current video here looks at the oldest time period of 1500 through 1100 BC. The oldest Marianas pottery was made as an earthenware, using locally available raw materials of clay mixed with temper inclusions and water. Red clay deposits of variable qualities can be found in many places. People could access the thickest and richest sources along the stream and river drainages. People probably would have removed plant roots and pieces of rocks, working toward a mostly clean supply of clay. Temper inclusions mostly were added into the clay. 
possibly using some of the rocks that naturally were in the clay in the first place, but more likely by adding grains of sand or deliberately crushed rock particles from another source. In the oldest Marianas pottery, the temper often included fine-grained beach sand, but other crushed rock particles were added in smaller amounts. People needed to add water to the clay mixture in order to shape the clay into the intended forms of bowls or other pottery products. The water usually happened to include various minerals that could affect the overall composition of the clay recipe, especially when using ocean water. People next shaped the clay recipes or mixtures into the forms of bowls or other pottery. Some of the broken pieces have revealed various traces of how people shaped the clay by hand. The ancient potters used various techniques, and sometimes they combined these techniques together toward the goals of producing particular shapes, sizes, and thickness of the earthenware. These techniques included pinching and punching of the clay into the desired shape, building elongated coils into various forms, creating slabs that could be conjoined or folded together, or building a mold perhaps in the ground that could be filled with the clay in the shape of the pottery vessel. In many cases, after the initial shaping of a pot, then people next held the interior of the pot steady while pounding the exterior with a stone or paddle. This extra effort of compaction could create stronger and thinner pottery walls. Some exceptional pieces were thinner than one millimeter. Usually, people removed any signs of paddle marks on the outward pottery surface. One approach involved exterior scraping or trimming that could remove an outer portion of the pot. Another approach involved wiping or brushing that could smooth the outer surface. In a few rare instances, the paddle marks still were visible, specifically when people used a carved paddle that created a decorative effect, known as carved paddle impressed pottery. In one unique case so far at a ritual cave site in Guam, vines or rattan either were wrapped around a paddle or else were woven into basketry and then impressed into the clay. Other than these few examples of exposed paddle marked surfaces or vine marked surface in one case, most of the oldest Marianas pottery was covered or coated with a red slip. This red slip used the same or similar red clay of the pottery, but perhaps with an extra ingredient of hematite, ochre, or another iron-rich material for a more vibrant red color. A few bowls were not red slipped, and instead they showed black surfaces. These pieces most likely had been fired inside an enclosed and smoke-filled bonfire, and then they may have been burnished by rubbing with a stone for creating a slightly shiny outward surface. After shaping the pottery and allowing those pots to dry into a leather hard condition, the next step was the firing. A bonfire or similar construction could create a firing temperature between 600 degrees and 1200 degrees Celsius, sufficient for transforming and hardening the clay into the resulting earthenware products. The oldest pottery shapes could be described as small bowls. The top openings mostly were about 20 centimeters in diameter, but some were much smaller. These sizes were suitable for individual people to use, whereas larger pots would have suggested group usage or communal contexts. When looking at the profile shapes, the pottery bowls have shown variations of straight-sided, slightly outcurved, and carinated forms. Added appendages were extremely rare, so far seen in fewer than 10 instances of pottery handles during this earliest period. In other regions, such as in East Asia or Southeast Asia at the same time, and in fact earlier, people had created many forms of handles, lids, and footing pieces. The 
earliest pottery artisans in the Mariana Islands probably knew about these techniques and traditions, but evidently they produced simple bowls without these appendages, except for the extremely rare instances of those handles. As seen with the paddle-marked pottery, other forms of decorations were remarkably rare within the earliest site layers. In most cases, these decorated pieces accounted for less than 1% of the total pottery fragments, but one instance of a ritual or ceremonial cave produced a denser concentration of decorated pieces in about 2% of the total fragments. Given the small numbers of decorated pieces, the decorative system as a whole has not yet been fully exposed. Furthermore, the thin walls of low-fired earthenware pottery tended to break into tiny fragments. Additional fragmentation continued when those pieces were buried beneath later sedimentary deposits for more than 3,000 years, while tree and plant roots, rainwater drainage, and other factors added to the effects of the thick overburden. People applied the decorations onto the most easily visible portions of the pottery, specifically on the outward-facing or upward-facing portion. Often, the decorations have shown traces of white slate lime, sometimes known as hydrated lime, made by burning limestone or marine shells and then quenching the material in water. Traditionally, slaked lime has been part of the recipe for chewing betel nut in the Asia-Pacific region. In the case of the earliest Marianas pottery, people used the same slaked lime for infilling into the decorations, thereby creating a sharp contrast against a red slipped surface or against a black burnished surface. The decorative techniques included dentate stamping, other point-tipped impressions, circle impressions, and fine line incisions. The dentate stamping was made with a comb-like tool, similar to a traditional tattooing needle. Close inspection can reveal the numbers of points in each comb, as well as the shapes of those points. Some of the point-tipped impressions resemble the use of a single pointed tool. Most likely, people used more than one pointed tool as part of a tool kit when decorating a bowl. The circle impressions in some cases were made by stamping with a cut piece of a hollow plant stem or similar object, resulting in standardized, same-sized, and perfectly rounded circles. In other cases, these circles were irregular and perhaps incomplete, and they most likely were incised as hand-drawn lines using a single-pointed tip tool. Additionally, a single pointed tip could produce a fine line incision in various shapes of elongated lines. People combined these decorative elements in various designs. These designs overall have presented a zone filling design system. First, the zones were created by repeating the same decorative technique across a horizontal row or throughout another contiguous space on the pottery surface. Next, those filled zones were juxtaposed with other zones, filled by a different technique or by the absence of any decoration. Many of the decorated bowls displayed simple horizontal rows or bands, typically made with repeated point impressions, circles, and line incisions. Sometimes a point was impressed inside a circle. Additionally, sometimes the larger sizes of hand-drawn circles were overlapping each other. In the cases of horizontal rows or bands, enough pieces have been recovered to allow confident extrapolation of what the complete designs may have looked like. For instance, when a pattern is documented on a piece or set of pieces representing at least 10% of a pot's circumference, then most likely the pattern can be extrapolated for the remainder of the pottery circumference. In the cases of decorations covering larger contiguous zones of the pottery, people tended to use the dentate stamping technique. This tool more easily could fill a larger zone. This approach was suitable for creating complicated multi-part design shapes. The other techniques of single points, lines, and circles mostly were used for horizontal rows or bands, 
the dentate stamping tool was used for filling larger and more complicated shapes or zones. As seen with the other decorative techniques, most of the dentate stamping designs were rectilinear. The rectilinear designs expanded on the repertoire of horizontal rows and bands by creating combinations of horizontal and vertical zones together. Rarely, the dentate stamped technique was applied in curvilinear designs. So far, these curvilinear designs have been documented only on the red slipped earthenware and not on the black burnished earthenware. In some cases, the dentate stamped pieces have been large enough to show repetitions of the designs, and then those repetitions can be extrapolated for the complete pottery bowl. In most cases, though, the dentate stamped designs involved multiple parts over large areas of a pottery bowl, and even the pieces representing 10% or more of a pot have been not quite enough to extrapolate the complete design. Despite the limitations of the few numbers of small pieces of decorated pottery, at least a few designs can be confirmed as repeated in two, three, or more of the decorated pots from different sites of separate islands. This repetition most likely reflects a shared cultural tradition among the people who made and used this pottery. As I have shown here, the earliest pottery of the Mariana Islands could be described in many technical and artistic aspects. Based on this information from the physical artifacts, much more could be interpreted. For now, the basic factual evidence from archaeology hopefully can encourage new ways of thinking about these ancient pottery artifacts of the Mariana Islands. What aspects are interesting for you and what parts would you like to explore more? Thank you for watching here. I will see you in the next video.